There we go. Go back into YouTube. Let's, uh... Come on, give me my... Let's go ahead and notify. Get You're not even gonna like notify me that uh, that we're live. Spoop. Genus Brewing. Genus Brewing. Come on, I'm like. Ah. Do we round? Live. There we go. Ah. Do we round? Live. There we go. Ah. Do we Ah. There we go. <laughs> All right. And we're talking and we're live. We're live. We're here. We're well, prepared. <laughs> You're always first, Daniel. At least in my book. You could ask my wife. That's a rule that I make. That Daniel's first? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, all right. Let's see if I can pull it up. Last week it didn't work on my uh, on the, on the iPad, iPad. So yeah. I can pull up my phone. Maybe I'll... It's looking like it's not loading the chat right now. Chat disconnected. Mm. Okay, so apparently this iPad is no longer usable for forever. I don't know what's like an update that's needed or what, but I'll just go ahead and pull it up on my phone like last week. Yeah, that's it. I mean, you know, it's useful for what it's useful for, but that that means that we just need like an actual dedicated live stream iPad. Yeah. That's or what just a giant like. monitor that's behind the... Ooh, yeah. That'd be perfect. Ooh, I got that a lot of text messages. Boop, 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 boop. Hopefully I'm hearing that popular. sound all day. Let's see. I am very popular. That's true. Uh, if you didn't know one thing about me, I'm going to get this a little bit closer to my face so that it's nice and sexy. So my voice is nice and sexy and I can talk quieter and people still hear me. How is the sound, everybody, while I'm pulling up the, yeah. let the us, U-tabs? Let us know. Let us know if we're uh, a little bit too close. Let us know if you want to get just a little bit closer. Uh, and uh, we'll definitely do that for you because you know that's what that's what we're here for. Sounds like people are uh, thinking we're in a decent spot. Yeah. All right. Well, we start got enough people the... in here. Let's start off with a joke of the day. Uh, so, what does a woman have two of that a cow has four of? Boobs. That's wrong. Actually, legs. But um. I like boobs. All right. There we go. I mean, yours was probably the better answer, but. Uh, We'll just go with that. Uh, it's <laughs> legs. They, cows have four legs, and, you know, women have two. So there we go. That is, uh, what's the word for being uh, sexist but against, uh, um, like, quadriplegics? That's not against quadriplegics. I mean, you're calling them not women. I'm, I'm, I'm calling cows. <laughs> cows are I'm also not women. I'm saying cows have four legs, and that's true. That is are, a very true statement. Are cows and, are cows and women kind of like squares and rectangles? I, um Wow. I mean, sometimes a cow from a distance, if they're standing right, can kind of look like a, you know, rectangle. There we go. Uh, so. I, <laughs> I, I don't know where I'm going with this. We're going, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah I'm, uh, you know, I'm a, just. There's a tangent. So, uh, welcome to Genus. Yeah, welcome to the live stream that we do every single Sunday at 845 Pacific Standard Time in the morning. Uh, for those of you who haven't uh, watched this before, we usually start out with some Genus Brewing news or general news around the brew house. Uh, we kind of do that while we're waiting for some people to tune in. Hopefully get up to that 70 to 100 people uh, live before we're able to jump into our beer of the week. Um, and then we go into uh, usually one to two discussion topics. Today we're going to be tackling raw ales because that's a really fun topic and it's a style of brew that we do um, semi-regularly here. Uh, it's a great way to save a lot of time during the brew day. Uh, and it's also really good for specific styles of beer if you're looking for um, certain characteristics in those beers. So that's what's going to be happening today. Be, uh, before we say something <clears throat> wrong in there, um, that's it's the cute. Not the coke. That's what I meant. Yeah, it's not. The I just typed it all. Gonna yeah. be there. Gonna be there. We have it. We have that on deck. We have it somewhere. Yeah. It um, exists. All right. Let's jump into some genus brewing news. So we got a new toy, which is always exciting and even more exciting because of what it does. So this is a CNC machine slash laser engraver slash 3D printer that we're going to be using to do some cool um, coasters and uh, merchandise kind of stuff as well as uh, we're going to try to be using that to make our tap handles. So that's kind of fun. Uh, tap handles uh, on the commercial scale, if you want them to look really nice, are tremendously expensive. So we just uh, mm. decided to buy a really fancy machine that can make them for us. Yeah, unless you can buy like hundreds of them at a time, then they get a lot cheaper. But I don't know about a lot. I want to say like even if you get like five hundred, yeah, they go down. Well, to I like, mean, relatively cheaper. Yeah. You know? Relatively, yeah. Like, like twenty cents less up per tap handle ends up being a lot of money at five hundred tap handles. At five hundred tap handles, though, a lot of the the quotes that I saw are still that 
you know, 20, maybe, maybe down to $20, but usually they're still above $25 and 500 times 25 is a lot. I believe yeah. it's in the neighborhood of 12,500. Generally for like basic tap handles too. So nothing super fancy, nothing super yeah. special, especially not what you can do with this. Bottom line is it's way more than I want to spend on tap handles. And so we're going to try to, <laughs> we're going to try to find a fun way to make them ourselves using the, uh, uh, the CNC. Cause it also has like, what's, what's the called the, the, the lathing function. So you yeah. can get like a square piece of wood and lay it down into your shape and then burn whatever. We're hoping we can make it work, but we'll see more details to come. Uh, it, so this is actually a uh, quote on there. Uh, Neablis. I don't know. I said that wrong. Ask, could we have partnered with a local casual woodworker? The key word there is casual. Yes. And we've done that before. Actually, uh, Logan, who we ate earlier in this uh, year, yeah. um, was a woodworker. It was, is a good uh, woodworker, did some really good stuff with us. But um, casual is kind of a word there. And when you're doing this professionally, waiting for three to four, not that Logan did this yeah. uh, at all, because he doesn't do that. Uh, but waiting for three to four months for a casual person to get done with these, while yes, you only paid for materials in the end, you did actually pay for that in time. And when it starts to, yeah, when it starts to scale up, uh, it still ends up being worth it. I mean, if you think about uh, you know a tap handle, maybe taking an hour, you got plus cost of materials. Um, you know, that hour of time before paying a minimum wage is still another $15 and $15 plus materials call that $20 a tap handle when the materials themselves, let's say are $5 and we have a machine that can do it automatically. There's cost equity wise, still not yeah. the, still not the best in the long run. If we end up getting to the point where we need a hundred tap handles, you know, that, that casual woodworker burning out a hundred or making out a hundred tap handles, handles and trying to pay, pay them less than minimum wage. That's not really fair for us or the woodworker. Yeah. So, I mean, if you're a small brewery and you just need a couple of them to throw a couple kegs around, I mean, that's hundred percent what we did. It's a great way to go. It's a great way to partner up with local artisans and people that, you know, to, uh, you know, build that community of your brewery. But when you start distributing more, this is going to be a super fun way to do it. And you're going to see some really cool things. Coasters, bags, anything, anything done on canvas. What does 3D print like, you know, any sort of toys? And I'll let you use your imagination on that um, with our logo on them. Never know. Uh, no, the reason we need 500 is because we're going to play a massive, massive game of uh, hide the tap handle. And if you find it, find it and bring it back, you get a prize. Yep. I'm not going to say what that prize is, but it's a prize. Yeah, it is a prize. Um, and it's going to be a prize that you will, uh, you will receive after returning the tap handle. Definitely. So definitely um, go right. look for those. They are currently hidden around the world. Uh, we're, we might do an app around them like Pokemon go, but with our tap handles. So, uh, keep an eye out. That would be really fun. Uh, it's the last day. Today is the last day to vote for us for the Inlander Best Of. There's a link in the description below. Um, if you guys would like to support us, we'd really appreciate you going on to the Inlander Best Of and voting for us in any category that we um, kind of qualify under. That's going to be best brewery, obviously. Um, also best podcast, because we do this live stream as a podcast, best virtual mm -hmm. event, um, best COVID pandemic pivot, because we're able to focus really, really heavily on building out our podcast during the COVID shutdown. Um, I think that's a pretty fun thing that we did. Yeah. Uh, what else is there on there? Uh, is there a uh, best bingo? I, we should win that. <laughs> There's not a best bingo, I don't think. Ah, dang it. Oh, and if uh, there is a best sushi, though, and so if all of you vote for Zona Blanca for best sushi, I think it'd be hilarious if we could make him win that. <laughs> it's raw fish, so I mean, technically, we're <laughs> kind of in the same vein. Zona Blanca is a local ceviche restaurant, and uh, the owner hates it when people call his stuff sushi. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, it is different, and people should leave the learn the differences, but it's still kind of funny and hilarious. And I'm gonna hilarious. turn down our ISO. I think we're a little bit too bright, a little bit too, a little too bit too uh, and bright and glowing. Yeah, people can't tell how tremendously red my face is right now. <laughs> a little bit too much time in the sun. You yeah, know? Some, sun something, something like that. Uh, yeah. All right. So, what else we got going on here? Ooh. We got uh, our Seltzies back on tap. Seltzer is up there and going. Uh, we oh, got some way better. cucumber lime on there that is just amazing. Um, it's a little bit of a problem because it is juice and it goes down so easily. Yes. Um, 
ridiculous. So that's kind of fun. If you want uh, more info on how to make hard seltzers, we have some videos out right now, but we're going to be doing another one because we got uh, a couple of fancy pressure fermenters. Uh, they're the clear plastic pressure fermenters. And honestly, I think they're the perfect fermenters for doing hard seltzer. So we're going to hopefully be getting a video out on that in the next couple of, uh, uh, of times. Yeah. Um, I also recommend if you're coming in for a seltzer, just add a tiny scotch of the Rasnarok kombucha in there, and oh, yeah. it is a game changer. Although that Rasnarok kombucha, I don't know if it's going to be lasting very much longer. Well, if you guys blow that off, we can get a new kombucha in, and the one she has out right now sounds It also amazing. sounds really good, and it'd both yeah. be good with a, with a hard seltzer. Definitely. Um, finally, I don't know if you guys see this. It's a wine bottle. Look at the top. It says Musho's Maple Wine. Uh, we talked about it last week, but Trent Musho, who... Uh, uh, he holds a, a YouTube channel called The Brew Show. Fantastic mm -hmm. channel. Go watch it. Um, sent us one of his a maple wine that he made on his uh, channel. And uh, I'm really excited to try it. And we're going to send him a care package in return. So that will yeah. happen later on in the day. If any of you guys out there want to, us to uh, give you a shout out, just send us beer. It's a good way to do it. Yeah. yeah I mean, 100%. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, are, are we uh, ready to move on? Or are we going to pop, uh, pop a beer first? Um, let's go ahead and let's do, before we go on to our, I'm not going to say it yet. Before we go on to that, let's go ahead and pop up. Uh, bingo. I forgot yeah. to link the bingo. Ah, oh, dang it. So those of you who don't know, uh, there is a bingo based on the uh, live show. It looks like somebody is trying to fish for a, uh, a square for a bingo right square. now. <laughs> uh, but go look it up, print it out, do it. If you win, we will give you a solid high five. Yeah, I it'll mean, be like, really solid. Really solid you with our ca it. with our with our mat, uh, hands. That one. So. Um, so this is from right. uh, Jake Lemire, a local home brewer who we've actually had on the channel before. Uh, he won Home Brewer of the Millennia from our local homebrew club this last year, um, and it is a hazy IPA that he did. And we were supposed to drink four or five weeks ago. I don't know. Uh, it, it was a little while ago. We did them dirty and accidentally lost it. Yeah. And then we thought it was a different one for a minute. Yeah. But this looks absolutely beautiful. There's no signs of oxidation in there. So way to go, Jake. Yeah. Notes of uh, peach, apricot kind of nose. Uh, a little bit of pineapple, tropical fruit. Um, overall smells fluffy. Like it smells like it's got that malt sweetness. Like it finished with a higher final gravity, which you want in a beer like this. You want to mm. kind of push forward that juiciness. Yeah, that's really nice. Um, very, very little to almost no hot burn, so really good. Mm -hmm. Overall, it's a well-done well done beer. And I know Jake works at a brewery that uh, semi-frequently does raw, hazy IPAs, so that might come into play later on in the show. What we're doing. This is really nice. I, I wish we would have drank it a little bit sooner. You can tell yeah. there's a little bit of high-end bitterness just from us aging it a little bit too long. Sorry, Jake. But uh, super delicious and going to go down my face real quick. <laughs> Better not be want to be be one of those off branded high fives. I want a name brand genus high five if I win. Oh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna laser etch our uh, logo into our hand, and then that's what that way it's name brand. I was gonna actually say that uh, we were gonna paint with some unknown substance on our hand the genus logo, and then high five them in the face. <laughs> that way it's stuck. Yeah, sixty nine people watching. Nice. That means right. that's a perfect amount of t uh, people to go on to our. Beer of the week, bum, 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 bum. beer of the week, yeah! And today's beer of the week is the uh, Hellesbach. Uh, Hellesbach, there's some debate as to whether or not it's the exact same beer or just very, very adjacent to the Maybach. Uh, personally, in my place, in my mind, they do live in two different places, although they are very similar. Um, uh, according to the BJCP guidelines, they're basically the same beer, but I'm always going to be think of a Maybach as a slightly... Um, slightly darker, not very darker, but slightly darker, hoppier version of the Hellesbach. Um, overall, they are a relatively uh, medium to high alcohol uh, for a lager style beer uh, with some accentuated bitterness. Overall, they should be, uh, they should be uh, sessionable, but having that high alcohol. So they're a great fest beer if you want to get super schmammied. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, for me too, I think there is a little bit, I mean, the argument that they're the same beer is uh, pretty valid but but for me it's almost seasonable it's season excuse me seasonable that one uh one of them being drank in one part of, you know fall one being drank in spring on that and you're kind of building them to uh be characteristic to the times that you're drinking it yeah uh while it's 
kind mostly the same it's just a scotch different on there and i absolutely love this style of beer on it the sessionable is exactly right this should drink like a hellas lager it should be really nice smooth easy going into it with just a tiny scotch of that maillard on the back end mm -hmm. which will just make it not quite caramely but rich malty sweet yeah, uh, and I'll kind of add to that uh, that I think that why it lives in two different places in both our minds has to do with how a lot of Americans specifically do things that are branded Maybach and Hellesbach. Um, so a lot of the examples that we'll see around uh, around here will be that Maybach is uh, honestly probably too dark for an actual Maybach t by the style guidelines, um, but they kind of really accentuate that redness, that autumn tone. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of us that'll do a Hellesbach, we're just thinking that nice Helles style beer, but made imperial. Yeah. Um, you know, and I guess uh, going, we're kind of hitting on this a little bit, but like my Bach to me is, is that little bit more festy ish, a uh, little bit more crisp in the air. I mean, you're kind of drinking it for me on the edges of spring and fall into it. Mm. And Helles Bach is a beer that should be easy for my taste buds, be easily drank in summer. Yeah. Like this should still be a refreshing beer on hot days. Yep. But you know, higher in alcohol. So you can have a couple of them while floating down the river and have a great time. Great time. Um, so let's go into some specific uh, stats that you know exactly what we're talking right. about. I got it. Uh, sorry. I got to throw this out there because somebody said they're from a microbrewery. So send us beer. In France. That might have been. Is that the same people that sent us Corazon a message a while ago? Sauvage? I don't know. Uh, maybe. But since you're from a microbrewery, you definitely should send us beer. Um, let's go into sp specific, specific stats. Um so that you know, this is a very light sessionable style of beer, uh, but the ABV is anywhere between 6.3 and 7.4, which is where, where that Bach names comes from. Mm -hmm. It's definitely a bigger beer. Uh, final gravity can be all the way as high as 1.018, which is on the thicker side. Uh, personally, I'm always gonna like mine down in the 1.011 to 1.014 range. Um, yeah. SRM is gonna be six to 11, so you can be on that very, very yellow, almost just borderline pushing orange kind of uh, tone, all the way to really getting into that amber, that lighter end of the amber spectrum on the SRM. Uh, IBUs anywhere between 23 and 35, uh, and these beers are gonna have a little bit of minerality to them as well. Not a lot, so it's not like a Pilsner, it's not like a, definitely not like anything uh, European or, uh, or not European, uh, English. <laughs> Um, or, uh, you know, American IPA, nothing in that range, uh, but just a touch more than that, that classic, uh, um, you know, that German style Pilsner, not Czech style, you know? So it's gonna have, let's say everything's in the 10 to 20 range rather than the nearly zero range. Yeah, <clears throat> definitely on that. And, it, you know, I mean, going by all of these, you can definitely see on that. It, this beer, while it's giving you that impression of being sweeter, even when it's finishing at the higher range, it still should finish very crisp and clean and not be heavy on the palate for it. Uh, I, personally, I like them in the, when it's almost just that perfect gold color in there. Yep. A little bit of copper highlights going on. If you get a little more into the copper range, a little bit more of the Maillard, I mean, I super enjoy that. I love it, but I want a little bit more light crispness to it for my taste. Yeah, so uh, let's go into some characteristic ing ingredients, how you're gonna get that. Um, this can be pretty much any variation combination of Pils and Vienna or Munich malts. Um, so that's kind of where you're gonna be using for your, uh, getting it towards the darker range. I'll add something like the aromatic malt that we said as our malt of the week last week. Um, could be a good addition as well in this style for that Maillard without needing that long boil time. Although in this style, a long boil time is always going to benefit that shelf stability and it's going to make it just a more dimensional beer. Um, as my yeah. malt that I'd probably use, I'd probably say this is a good contender for a Halcyon as a base malt. Uh, Halcyon would be uh, honestly pretty darn good with this, especially if you don't want to boil as long. And while we're saying there's a long boil, this is not as long as a, a boil as, say, a Doppelbach or, you know, a Dunkelbach or anything mm -hmm. like that. I mean, a good hour and a half, two hour boil, catch a little bit of that Maillard going in there, but not too much. If you're using Halcyon, I'd say that's a perfect way to uh, just actually use Halcyon by itself on that. Maybe a touch of aromatic for it, go for uh, hour long boil and you're gonna get something that's really good coming out of it. That is a nice standard brew day. Yeah, Halcyon just as yeah. a base malt, uh, we've talked about it before, but it's a malt that we love the flavor of by itself, which makes it a really good candidate for these beers where you're really letting the malts that you're using kind of show off. Yeah, uh, I think honestly, uh, it, 
I mean, a great pills with some really good Vienna in there. I would say if you're going to use Vienna, uh, either use a heritage style Vienna or go for a true German Vienna on this. They're a little bit lighter, just a little touch more biscuity than the uh, Great Western or American Vienna type uh, tends to be on that. Mm -hmm. But I think, honestly, the uh, Viking Extra Pale would be a really good base malt as well for yeah. something different uh, or if you can't get a hold of some of these other things. And with that Viking Extra Pale, which is very, very accessible, it's actually one of the biggest brands that works with companies like More Beer. Um, I actually think it's More Beer might be the only accessible way for you guys to get any of the Viking malts. Um, but yeah. uh, they... Uh, More Morbier is a great company to work with. Uh, we buy a lot of stuff from Morbier, um, so we like kind of showing them some love whenever we can. But the Viking Extra Pale is a malt that they should usually have in stock because they they are the number one, I think, American distributors of that malt. So yeah, and accessible for you guys. Unless you happen to uh, at live in Europe, because it is a then you, yeah. Scandinavian malt, uh, something like that. Yeah. So, somewhere out there. Delicious, <clears throat> awesome malt. If you haven't used it before, it's a phenomenal malt. Get your hands on it. Use some of it. it, it I really enjoy it. It's a nice, light base malt. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm still going to go with uh, – I didn't actually put down a malt hops and, and yeast for this, but I'm still going to go with I want Halcyon to be my base malt. As my, we'll call that my malt of the week. Halcyon, lock it in. What's yours? Uh, I mean, you oh can go man. with Viking Extra Pale too, I guess. If we're going to go malt of the week, it probably would be what I'm recently obsessed with, which is uh, Chevalier. Chevalier, yeah. But that's not uh, completely inappropriate. Actually, that wouldn't be inappropriate. Halcyon with just maybe a 2% of Chevalier would give you the right color, the right biscuiting. Yeah, I was going to say, right. if you put the Chevalier as a lower percentage yeah. instead of the 100%. Uh, we'll talk that. about that as a malt of the week another week. Uh, for this in this beer here, I mean, like if we're going to do a uh, malt of the week that you could use – Anytime, do the Maillard, don't do the Maillard for it and create a really great Hellesbach. Uh, Halcyon is probably right on top for that. Yeah. Um, hop of the week, it's going to be anything Sazer type. We've kind of done a lot of, I think, back to back to back German beers. Uh, so yeah. we're not going to go too deep into any of the hops, uh, but any of the Sazer types or any of the Americanized versions of Sazer ha uh, hops, uh, Mount Hood, Sterling, Cluster. Cluster is a completely American hop, but with some of those kind of same flares as a. Uh, as classic Sazer hops have. Um, or if you want to go uh, New Zealand, a lot of those New Zealand triploids will work too. Yeah, uh, doing some of the softer ones, uh, Waiidi. Yeah. Uh, probably could be really good in that. Um, lower pro uh, proportion for it. The Racco could uh, actually make some really good, uh, interesting fruity flavors. But I'm going to come back and actually say for a hop of the week on this particular beer, for getting beautiful, beautiful hoppiness using very little amounts, will be Magnum. Oh yeah, that'd be perfect. Because uh, Magnum has, you know, it is a, it's got a lot of those same Sazer German Magnum, a lot of those same Sazer uh, types. But you really don't want to taste too much, so you don't want it to be like a Pilsner, like a, a Czech Pilsner, where Saz is like a dominant flavor. You want it to be sub subtly, you want it to be subdued. You want to get all your mm -hmm. bitterness off of it with just hints of spice. Yeah, and uh, uh, this beer does have more hoppiness than uh, most of the other, well, almost all the other box styles. It should <clears throat> have a bigger hoppy impression, but again, it's not anything that's going to be huge on that. You're, uh, you're balancing it like you would a Hellas in there. You're catching a little bit, but most of it's going to be that really nice, delicious malt profile coming out of it. Yeah. So I'd, I would I actually really love Magnum for this. A couple of tiny additions of Magnum. Yeah. Catch a little bit of that indistinct, delicious German hoppiness. And yeast, I'm throwing this out there. I'm going to say Harvest is my yeast to go for, mm. do for this. Uh, Harvest is a very good malt-leaning yeast if you ferment it. Um, uh, on the cold and then maybe ramp it up to a medium cold. I'm saying start at... 50 and then ramp up to maybe 56 somewhere during the fermentation. I think you're going to get a really good effect off of harvest. Uh, and then from there you can just straight crash. Uh, there's not a huge need for a VDK rest, if any, um, especially if you're giving it the proper fermentation time, you're letting it, you know, ferment for two months. Yeah. Uh, and you know, <clears> that's <throat> actually an interesting thing about this beer too. A tiny, tiny, slight bit of uh, DMS aroma is actually acceptable in guidelines for this. Yeah. Uh, me, personally, I wouldn't like it in there. Um, I'm just not a fan of that in most of my beers. But I think if you have just a tiny little bit of corniness over the top, that would be all right. You know? Um, so that, I think, pretty much covers our beer of the week. If you guys got questions on the Maybach or you want to you know, throw out some things that you think about in terms of what malts you would like to use, hops you'd like to use. 
Nice. Got some high Perfect. carb in that. Uh, yeah. Uh, all right. Question from uh, Dr. Pepper LP. Do we ship beer? Um, as far as shipping it out. Legally, no. A lot of other places. Washington State makes it very, very, very hard for us to do that. Uh, so, no, we don't really generally ever do that. Uh, we do actually have a beer delivery service for any of the, you that are living uh, locally here. Oh, no, it's a Berliner. I, I'll take some yeast. Yeah, I was going to say, I, it looked like crystal, crystal clean, but I'm like, I want that stuff in the bottom for sure. Yeah. The, uh, from our conversation last week, a lot of the time you don't want to pour yeast in there in a Berliner vice. Oh. All right, fine. In a Berliner vice, it's actually a... a uh, good style to have your yeast back up in suspension but if any of you living locally we do deliver beer within a five mile radius so if you uh, get within five miles we will grab a scooter and uh scoot some beer on over to you ah scoot scoot mother yeah yeah Uh, all right let's jump into topic number one which i think is a really interesting topic that not a lot of people have even heard about or know about um Hopefully, if you watch this channel for long enough, you've definitely heard us mention it a time or two. Uh, but that is brewing a raw ale. Um, raw ale is my go-to style of beer when I don't want to spend a full day brewing. Um, and basically, what that means is it's a beer that you can go straight from the mash tun into your fermenter while skipping an entire vessel. You don't have to bring it into a boil vessel at all and skipping, obviously, the entire step of boiling. So you save a lot of time. Yeah. Uh, and, it, you know, actually kind of coincidentally that wasn't even on purpose this is a perfect <clears throat> example of what normally is a raw beer we're drinking a berliner vice mm-hmm. from uh, wander brewing over in uh, the seattle area of bellingham Washington. i think they are yeah I, I, that's why i said seattle area yeah. <laughs> bellingham yeah uh, don't know if this one was actually raw a lot of commercial breweries don't do raw beer just because of a lot of uh, packaging and uh, contamination issues that could happen uh but berliner is a great example for that and this is literally, I mean, raw is not, you know, super raw, but you're not boiling. That's the basic gist of this. You are not boiling this beer um, to make a raw beer. It's delicious. It's a great way to get some extra flavor in there. Well, there's a lot of people already right. jumping onto, onto the comments here. Um, yeah. Alex and Camilla Swanson, super curious to know how many people have local homebrew stores versus ordering online. Oh. I live within 15 miles of me. That's going to be a question for the chat. If you guys want to chime in, go ahead and answer that. Uh, raw stouts, wheat beers, sours, and hoppy. Um, I don't know if that's a question, but all those can be done, and we have done probably all of those. All of those. Here's a question. 100% Chevalier for an English IPA? Yes. Absolutely. Oh can work. Uh, it will be a very intense malt character. The Chevalier can be very, very intense as 100% beer, but it tastes amazing. And so if you're willing to put in the work of doing with that, I would say I'd want to do a long boil time. Uh, I might even consider a step mash, and I would say if you are – uh, I would make sure that you're really back end loading some of the hops. So you want those big English hop characters. Well, remember our smash beer with Barber Rouge was a hundred percent Chevalier. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So with that, and I did very, very traditionally English hop, this English hopping schedules as well as amounts going into it and then hit the back end mm-hmm. very heavily. Um, what did we, I don't remember what we fermented that with, but it was an amazing beer. It was, it was a blend of yeast. Uh, sm- it probably was. So we probably couldn't pick out the exact yeah. yeast. but Smash beer with 100% Chevalier and the uh, French Barber Rouge, and it was an absolutely perfect English pale just with that malt right in there. It is very intense. You're going to have to balance that out really well, but love the malt. Go for it. I support it. Send us some. Um, hopeful brewing suggested temperature schedule for WLP 820 in the tropical stout. We haven't carried White Labs in about five years, so I'm not sure which one WLP 820 in a tropical uh, is. Uh, but we use uh, the fine stuff in Lager Strain, and so we'll ferment that at you know 64 ish for a tropical stout, maybe 68 even. Fine stuff does really well at warm temperatures. I've seen it done up to 72. I probably wouldn't go that high, but anywhere. In the the mid to mid high 60s is probably a good for if you use the fine stuff in our strain. Um, we got people asking about raw nipas. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a second. The and raw uh, funky sour method for uh, raw beer. Actually, sours are phenomenal, especially mixed firm sours are phenomenal. The raw beer method <clears throat> because you're leaving so much extra starches and proteins and num nums for Brett to just break down and turn into beautiful things. Uh, 
in my opinion, raw is almost the way to go for especially mixed firm sours. Um, what hops do you recommend for a flathead cherry double? Uh, Styrian, Goldings, or Fuggles? Well, if you're going cherry on that, if you're going very, very lightly on them, I would say that you could probably use some Barber Rouge. Yeah, Barber Rouge would work too. Um, or something very floral like that, but go very light on those. I mean, for the Dubell on there, especially with the cherry in it, you're getting most of your character from yeast. You're getting most of your character from uh, cherries as well as the sugars. So the hops should be very restrained and in the background. Yeah. Hang on, there was an amazing one. Uh, up here pro brewer uh adam chumbly is saying that some pro brewers have mentioned to me that they're using much lower ratio of star sand solution than what is recommended um if it's high enough to kill it, things use if, it. if you've got a ph meter go for it that, that stuff's got to be down below three two yeah uh <clears throat> if you can make sure it's below three two and that's less than the ratio that they tell you and it probably is less than the ratio that they tell you that because the company is figuring you're not going to measure exactly. Let's give a safe range so you're going to kill everything. Nocturnal Brewer. I love this one. Uh, is there a possibility of contamination with raw since you're not technically hitting oh, killing? Let's save that one because I've okay. got it later on in the thing. Okay. Sorry. We're coming back to that, Nocturnal. Um, all right. So let's move on to the, the topic and then we can get back to some more questions as we kind of go through this. Um, so first of all, I want to talk about different ways to do raw oh, it's ales. Right there. I, sorry. Yeah. All um, right. Let's talk about some different ways to do raw ale. So you guys all know the general gist of a raw ale is a raw ale isn't boiled. And there's some debate as to whether or not bringing it up to a quick two minute boil counts. I personally leave that out of the equation. I don't count boiling at all or even raising up to a boil temperature as a raw ale. Uh, and so the different ways we'll do it. Um, the first and probably the easiest way for most people to do it is a single infusion. You mash at 152 to 153 for an hour and then go straight from your uh, straight sparge into your fermenter. Mm hmm. Uh, I'm also going to throw in here, this is a wonderful beer. If anybody can get hold of the uh, Wander Champagne Toast, get some. And this does taste raw a yeah. little bit. It has some extra weedy meatiness uh, in there to taste raw. Uh, we'll yeah. talk about the flavors of rye ales too. I have that. Yeah, right down there at the bottom. Sorry, I had to jump in there with that. Yeah. So you're going straight out of there. I mean, you're mashing. You bring it up to temp and you put it straight into your fermenter and uh, let it chill down, throw some yeast at it. Yeah, so you can do that as a single infusion. Um, and we'll talk about why and when we get into the pasteurization temperatures and stuff about killing bacteria. Um, but the way that we actually do our raw ales is with a step or ramped mash. Um, step can be through, um, you know, starting out at, let's say, a protein rest, going up to a sacrification rest, and then to mash out. But we do a ramped mash, which we mash in at 143 and then we'll slowly ramp it overnight to about 165 or whatever it gets to over the next, you know, over the course of 12 hours or whatever we do our mash for. Yeah. There's a lot of reasons for that. Um, Jimmy Johnson, you were right. The smash used Barber or used um, Sundew in it. So the yeast and the oh, smash yeah. was Sundew. <clears throat> but there are uh, a lot of the reasons that we do that is to create a more complex beer with it. Uh, you're going through several different steps uh, at that time. And a lot of the time, if we're creating sour beers, we'll also include the acid rest into it. Mm. Hit it about 110, get some pre-acidification going on, jump it up, break down some of those proteins. Because this is a raw beer, that protein step, uh, that 130 step, is, in my mind, very important. Uh, break down the proteins, break down the extra stuff, because you're not going to boil and precipitate some of these things out. Yeah. So. Um, uh, another thing that was commonly done uh, in old farmhouse style brewing uh, was the Stein beer method of making raw ales. <clears throat> And you can completely boil with the Stein, doing a Stein beer as well, as we showed in our making a Stein beer in the Anvil Foundry video that we did a couple years ago. Um, but uh, you don't necessarily have to. So Stein beer is going to give you a lot of Maillard and a lot of caramelization while you're bringing that up to temperature. Basically, you can start with uh, water and grain at room temperature and then slowly add hot rocks. Um, and then that hot rock is going to give you some caramelization of the sugars and slowly raise your entire mash temperature. So you keep repeating this process until you get all the way up to a mash out temperature. And then you can just go straight into a fermenter from there. Yeah, <clears throat> um, that's how we do it uh, on there. I mean, it's, there's a bunch of different ways to actually do this, uh, but this is kind of what we prefer. Uh, the single infusion, super easy, super great, especially doing sours on there. The step ramp, I think, gives you some of the best flavors. But the stein, 
the stein mm -hmm. getting those extra caramels from those hot rocks going in there yeah like that's and the maillard reaction like it's get it's got a lot more complexity doing it as a stein method uh plus depending on how you do it you can also get some smoky kind of characteristic from going right over a, a, a you know a direct fire but you can do the stein method you you can fake the stein method with like a a stove or something like that too or an oven if you wanted to mm -hmm. um if you didn't want those smoky flavors that come from pulling rocks right out of a fire although you should uh because it's delicious it is let's talk a little bit about uh does it need to pasteurize this is a question that we kind of had before uh mm -hmm. or is there a risk of infection um the short answer is no and the long answer is also no um so uh at 153 for 60 minutes that's technically a pasteurization temperature so if your overall mash is above that 153 or ends above that 153 then you're probably okay now uh does is it going to kill off spoiling bacteria, namely lactobacillus which isn't necessarily a spoiling bacteria because a lot of us like that bacteria uh, then you can mash lower because it will kill off any harmful bacteria at 145 for even 30 minutes okay mm -hmm. so you might end up with some lactobacillus uh, but at that point you're kind of relying on com competition from the bacteria or cultures that you're adding to make sure that you don't get any flavors that you don't want yeah uh, i would say that uh, risk is risk of contaminations for these style of beers is it's a little bit higher because you're working with things without boiling and if you're used to boiling then you're generally used to counting on the boil for sterilization of some parts we count on the boil for sterilization of our counterflow chiller because we run the hot work through it for a couple of minutes before we use it to sterilize it you don't really do that with these beers so you need to make sure that uh, your equipment and i think where the contamination is the biggest risk is the equipment uh, make sure that your equipment is fully sterilized and ready to go for it yeah the easiest way to do this is uh, we like to sparge with hot water so that's going to kind of give us a quote unquote mash out temperature at the same time um, but while you have sparge water heated up to that 180 degrees or whatever you can just run that hot water through your counterflow chiller or anything else that the beer is mm -hmm. going to touch now um, so that'll be enough to make sure that that's all sterile uh, and that's kind of our preferred method to do it um, if you're doing a a raw ale that's going to be a sour another kind of benefit that you have is you can also pre-acidify your wort so when you're adding your lactic acid bacteria getting down below 4.5 uh, or food safe would be 4.2 ph um, is going to select against any harmful bacteria and select against most spoiling bacteria that are going to make your beer taste bad um, you'll still allow for some lactic acid production from lactobacillus or uh, wycillium um, the two lactic acid producing by bacteria that we see in making sour beers. Uh, but it's not going to let pretty much anything that you don't want acting on your beer to do its job. Um, there, there are so many phenomenal questions. We are going to get back to a lot of these. If you can't tell, we're kind of trying to hit a lot of our points right now so we can come back to some of these. I love this, guys. Keep it coming. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So benefits, benefits. Let's get into a few benefits. I think we're going to answer a few questions here. Let's get into benefits of why you're doing this and why you would do it for some specific styles. Uh, I think I saw a question in there that would raw beers be beneficial for doing for malt forward beers. And then he mentioned uh, German beers being an example of that. German yeah. beers would benefit from it. You should make a raw heffy and you should make a raw heffy and a lot of German beers, especially German soured beers, are raw beers. Yeah. Nosa, Berliner Weiss, prime, prime, perfect examples of a raw beer. Yeah, a lot of people that are in America that have had Gozas haven't had Gozas because the uh, brewer has made a salted kettle sour that's not brewed traditionally, not brewed like a Goza. So they end up with a super clean, sour, salt, fruited kettle sour bomb. Yeah. which is a great beer, but it's yeah. not a Goza. Yeah. So benefits for that high proteins and starch. <clears throat> and we kind of hit on this a little bit that the high proteins and starch, especially for sour beers are super, super beneficial because the bacteria is an alternate yeast love to eat these things. Yeah. Another reason that that's uh, really beneficial is that a lot of these beers go really dry. And I can tell you, I mean, the champagne toast is right. This is dry champagne. Yeah. Uh, they go very dry. Having those extra pro proteins and starches in there really help to uh, boost the body of the beer and the uh, fullness of mouth flavor. So it doesn't go 
astringently dry. It leaves something for you to chew on uh, and something to kind of balance out the harsher flavors of the acid, especially. Yeah. Uh, you know, and that's a really good thing for long age sours, for mixed firm barrel age sours that are going for several years. All of these high proteins and starches, uh, especially Britannia myces, is going to work on these things. And after everything else is done, Brett's going to come along and be like, oh, you guys can't ferment this. Let me go ahead and eat what most of this beer is made of and yeah. create some really cool, interesting flavors that it actually doesn't get when it ferments sugars because it's a different fermentation process. So for that reason, a raw ale is a great candidate for any of those styles that are going to have that mixed fermentation, especially with Britannomyces. But honestly, if you have a mix of Britannomyces, Petio, Lacto, uh, and Sac, Sac's can be kind of the first to act on it with some Petio, uh, or sorry, with some Lacto, and then Petio and Bread are gonna kind of cyclically go through and make you know bad beer good and good beer bad, and then eventually it's gonna all just be good. good. Oh yeah. Uh, and then to go along with it, why you should make a raw Hefeweizen. Oh, my God. The grainy green flavors coming out of this. If you really want your Hefeweizen to taste like a wheat field and just that fluffy, fluffy wheat grain goodness, raw. 100% yeah. raw. That brings us into some risks though, because there are some things you have to consider with how to handle it if you're doing a shorter fermentation time, which you would be with a Hefeweizen. So uh, some of the risks, uh, we've kind of talked about the possibility for bacteria, uh, really not a huge thing unless you're mashing below 150, um, and, and in which case the really only bacteria you got to worry about is some uh, lactobacillus, but even then it's not really a risk. A lot of lacto dies at 120. Yeah, but uh, the, the risk that you will have is there, that proteiny graininess can get overbearing if you don't handle it properly. So you want the right amount of, amount of that protein character, that fluffiness in your Hefeweizen. You want the right amount of that green, uh, grainy kind of taste in your Hefeweizen to give it character without it becoming too much, which means you have to do some things during fermentation uh, or even during your mash to kind of break some of those down and uh, make it so that the beer is not going to be you know, overly thickified. I'm just washing this glasses, unless oh. we're getting new glasses. Are you getting new glasses? I can get new glasses. All right, we're getting new glasses. So uh, ways to avoid that, um, like Peter was talking about, in your uh, like Hefeweizens or wheat beers or things like that, uh, is adding some zymes to the mat or um, how, sorry, adding some enzymes to the fermentation. I'm getting really excited about what's coming up next if I'm distracted. Uh, adding some enzymes to the fermentations to help some of those starches further convert into sugars and then ferment out a little more completely so you just still have some of the grainy flavors left over and not a whole lot of the starchy flavors as well. Uh, or using a yeast that can really convert some of those flavors. So doing a raw saison with French saison is going to be incredible. Absolutely incredible in oh, my yeah. opinion. Um, so one of the enzymes that you're going to be looking for that I think is a fun one to add to, let's say for a Hefeweizen specifically, uh, is going to be Clarity Firm. Uh, Clarity Firm was originally designed as a clarifying uh, enzyme. However, that's kind of proven to not be the case if you've got the wrong kinds of starches and proteins in there. But what it will do is help drop out some of the graininess that you can get from certain proteins that are in uh, fermentation. Clarity Firm is an easy one to add during, uh, like when you pitch your yeast, it'll drop out some of those enzymes, or so, sorry, some of those proteins, um, but leave a lot of, you know, a big protein matrix that's going to help keep your beer fluffy and taste like some yummy grains. Um, you can also consider doing things like uh, using an amyloglucosidase enzyme if your beer is overly thick. Um, I've had some of these raw ales come through and still finish out at like 10.08 to 10.12 if they uh, have a lot of proteins in them, even if I add uh, some AMG. But you do risk, depending on how you mash, you do risk uh, if you have two overly modified malts um, or uh, you know, your, your mash was too efficient, you do risk bruting that beer. So that might be a, you know, a risk unless you're trying to do like a raw lager which we have done raw lagers as well. Um, yeah. And uh, that was exactly our strategy, Clarity Firm and AMG. If you guys have ever seen us wear the uh, Gina Stone Light shirt, or if you have bought it, that was <clears throat> a raw lager. And, and it, it was tasted amazing. delicious. It was absolutely delicious. Uh, lactic acid bacteria in here, that's a risk for this. Like we said, if you don't get high, en high enough in your mash or you're mashing low, there is some risk for this to go through. One way to... Uh, one way to actually hop these beers uh, and to minimize the risk of the lactic acid is to actually hop your sparg water. 
Um, and put your hops in, boil them in the sparg water, bring it back down to uh, your mash out temperature, and then mash out with it. And now you have some hoppiness going into uh, your raw beer, which is how we did uh, actually a raw IPA. Yeah. Um, so hopping the, uh, that water is going to pretty much eliminate all the risk of any of the off flavors or any of the, uh, um, spoiling bacteria, but it's also going to give you a, a heads up on getting some IBUs into your beer. Okay. Uh, well, there's a lot more to talk about this. Uh, obviously there's some great questions going on. Shall we hit, uh, hit up some of these? Cause I feel like, yeah, let's hit up some questions. And well, also let's talk about this. Let's talk about this maple wine. This tastes like bourbon to me. Like this tastes like straight up bourbon. Not like not like the alcohol of bourbon, but like all the flavors are like bourbony flavors. This is, the sugar came from maple. Maple sugar. Uh, did he use maple syrup or did he actually just use like sap and uh, just raw maple syrup? Raw maple syrup. I don't know if he added anything else to it. I'm pretty sure he did 100% maple syrup, but I forget. it's been a while since I watched the video. Uh, the nose it, it has some high alcohol notes, like some really dry meads. The flavor is pretty, pretty damn amazing though. I didn't expect it to be, I thought I expected it to be overly maple. Oh my God. That's, it's woody, it's fruity. Maple is the last thing I would use to describe this. Yeah, I mean, you can get some maple leaf flavors in there. It's also got a citrus tone. It very, you I'm get, guessing that came from yeast though. I yeah. think that's, uh, I think he used EC1118. It's like it was aged on maple wood. Yeah. Like rather than actual maple sugars. This is amazing. More people need to make maple wine. This is a really fun one. Uh, if you guys watching out there um, want to look at this, it's Trent Musho, the Brew Show's uh, maple wine. Um, you should go comment, it, comment on it and say, hey, Trent, we saw this on Genius Brewing and it looked really tasty. And it is really tasty. And Thomas, yeah. Thomas, if you're watching, this should be at uh, Emery's. <clears throat> you should do one of these. Yeah, you should. Okay. All right. Uh, oh, man. There are so many things that are going back through there. Uh, do, 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 do. Give us a second. To um, uh, Adam Tremblay, a local brewer in Marysville. Uh, what it, I just lost it. In Marysville, uh, mentioned that several other pro brewers noticed that Barbarouge didn't pull the berry flavors if whirlpooled. Oh, yeah. How did Genus, Genus utilize the Barbarouge? Uh, so the first time that I used it in that smash, uh, like I said, I did a very traditional English, uh, like an English bitter hopping schedule on that. So you were catching, okay, I don't do 60 minutes. I'm going to take that back. Uh, for the 60 minute edition, I think that was at um, 35. Then a uh, 15 minute edition, a five minute edition, and a whirlpool edition. I will say that we got very, very floral and berry flavors coming out of it, mm. but that was hitting the whole spectrum in it. Uh, when we did the uh, hazy with it, because we did do a hazy with that, uh, that and the uh, XJs with the sundew. Yeah. Everything that was in the back end, there was less berryness in that the less of the strawberryness uh, in that one because most of it was in whirlpool and back end uh, a lot more floralness in it um in all honesty for barber rouge i love the way it came out either way uh, i would say that if you're uh, from our small experience and if other people are having that experience expect floral strawberry like a strawberry field flowering rather than <clears throat> straight berry fruit flavors in the back end yeah. that's been our experience but i still think that's wonderful it's worth noting that our system um, is designed like an oversized homebrew system and we've kind of manipulated it in a way that really maximizes certain flavors that you can get off of hops which i don't think depending on the commercial brewery i don't think a lot of commercial brewers have the same uh, ability to extract um hop oils in the same way that we can yeah uh without getting bigger and far more expensive equipment yeah um, Jimmy, will the raw beer will the, will raw beer and sours mainly just be beneficial for Brett and Petio, or would lactic sours benefit as well? For example, farmhouse quikes state that they have bacteria. Um, I think it's is lactic. Um, the so you yeah the the benefit won't be the same for just lactic and or lacto and uh, um, quike yeast. Uh, 
enzymatic bacteria or bacteria that can slowly chew on a lot of the byproducts of fermentation are going to be the ones that are going to really benefit from that long-term aging. That's not to say that a lactic acid sour wouldn't get the benefit of a fuller body, some extra grainy flavors, which uh, quike tends to, um, I think, perform really well when you have those extra grainy flavors already in there from a raw beer. So flavor-wise, I would say they'd still benefit, but fermentation-wise, are they going to do anything extra? No, you're really just going to get that extra from the Brett and Petio. Uh, Jimmy, <clears throat> to answer that question, come in and drink peach chew. It's raw and made with quike. Yeah. That actually, uh, Gina Stone was raw and made with quike. Um, the IPA that we made with, or that was raw was made with quike. Yeah. Um, I would say that quike plays extremely, extremely well with these flavors. We like that raw quike combo because um, it shortens our brew day by a lot of time because that way we don't have to chill all the way from, you know, we don't have to chill all the way down. And we also don't have to boil, bring all the way up to boil. So just in that chilling time to get into the fermenter, it's way faster. Yeah. Uh, Riv Riv Rivera. Uh, gravities are <clears throat> usually a little higher coming out of the mash tun. Do you adjust uh, by adding untreated water? I'm not sure if this question is into raw ales or beer as a whole. As this warms up, there's so much more maple coming out. Like, yeah. Warm is the way to drink it. Um, so in raw ales, yeah, your gravity, you, there's so much other stuff in there um, that's definitely going to push those gravities up. In all honesty, we don't really worry about hitting target numbers so much as we worry about making great beer. Uh, but if you're working towards target numbers, yeah, just blend back uh, with some RO or distilled water in that. That way you're making sure you're not getting extra minerals out of it from an unknown source. Uh, you can adjust that water with minerals yourself to match the water you have. Just keep in mind how much you blend with it is going to take your mineral content down. Yeah. Javier Chirinos, why is lactic acid the go-to acid for beers? Why not Ooh. citric, malic, or tartaric? Ooh. That is because of uh, uh, flavor. Um, each acid has a different flavor, and I call lactic acid the sweet acid because it tastes relatively sweet and soft in the palate to the sharpness that you get. Whereas malic, citrus, tartaric, all those are really aggressive. They're the face puckering, um, no different than like uh, acetic acid, which is vinegar. Um, you can eat warheads, but you can't drink vinegar. Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> to go along with this, uh, lactic acid, I would uh, kind of put that in layman's terms. Lactic acid is the most friendly acid out there. That's why you see a lot of ke kettle sours with lactic acid in it. You can have a fair amount and still be very palatable, very drinkable. But that being said, going into some mixed firm sours, uh, PDO as well as Brett will create some acetic acid. They will definitely create malic acid in there. Uh, depending on what fruit you're using, there's going to be some tartaric uh, going on as well. So when you have those mixed firms that are huge sour bombs, generally that's because of the mix of the acids in there. Um, they're very delicious and they're great, but it is very hard to control them and create a beer in good balance with those acids. So most commercial brewers are only going to use things to produce lactic so they can produce an easier, better tasting beer that customers will enjoy. Um, Geoff Nahashon, how do you feel about no-chill techniques? With the drought here in California, we're looking to cut, to cut down on water. Um, honestly, they, they're more or less a risk. There's a lot of things you can't do with no chill. Um, so if you're doing a no chill, really pick a style that's going to be friendly to no chill. I would also add maybe pre acidify your work a little bit. Um, so the styles that I would say are going to be great for no chill. Honestly, something like a Hefeweizen could work really well. Uh, anything that's going to take a German or acid hearty yeast. Uh, with any no-chill method, I'd probably try to pre-acidify my wort at least a little bit. Try to get that 4.5 and then hit it with a German ale strain. So a lot of those would be the ones that I'd, I'd try to go with. Um, mm -hmm. No-chill IPAs are just never going to work because there's no way to utilize your hops properly. Um, but anything that's not hoppy probably will work just fine. Um, just uh, you, you got to kind of know your range and know your limits with no-chill. Yeah. Uh, Tyler uh, Kipping, <clears throat> for kettle sour raw beer, will lacto keep souring if pitched with sack, or should you develop sourness <clears throat> before pitching sack? And this entirely depends on your strain of lacto. Uh, so 
what is it, Buchneri and Delbrucki all work, uh, both work at higher temperatures. And I think they stop producing good sour, souring stuff around 90 ish. Yeah. Um, which is a very extreme range for a sack strain, unless it's something like French Saison or some Quike strains, versus uh, things like Plantarum and. I forget the other one. Plantarum, uh, definitely. Plantarum works all the way down in the 70 pretty successfully. And so you can 100% co-pitch that with SAC. It does work faster than SAC does. Um, and that's kind of one of the things about doing a mixed firm sour is you have lacto, SAC, PDO, Brett going on, and they all kind of work in conjunction. Uh, so you will still get a little bit of sourness going on with the sac, but once the uh, Saccharomyces takes off, generally most of the souring will be done because it will outcompete that lacto, depending on what strain of lacto you're using. So yep. For us, what we generally tend to do is we'll throw a beer into a fermenter at right about 120 degrees. We'll throw our lacto strains in at that point, and then when it drops down to about 80, we'll throw our sac strain in and then uh, let it go. Eugene Stroken, how would you clear a raw ale? Um, so we kind of talked, talked about this before, but uh, clearing a raw ale, a couple things you can do. You can add mash enzymes to kind of pre-break down certain things in the mash. Are you about to get some mail? Ooh, yeah, I'll go get some mail. Um, you can add Clarity Firm. Clarity Firm is a great co-pitch uh, that you can add to um, help uh, break down certain proteins during fermentation. And then finally, we like to do some sort of a fermentation enzyme, i.e. Uh, ultra firm or just some AMG. Um, so that fermentation enzyme is again going to help clarify some uh, clarify your beer um, by breaking down starches that cause haze. <clears throat> Ten zero zero two. Huh. Um, how long will you guys dry hop with a keg and hop rocket pump? Um, I did two hours on my latest brew, but curious if I should try a day or more. Um, depends on how confident you are. So, I mean, t uh, if, you, if it's actually recirculating over the hops, um, it's going to just depend on how confident you are that everything's in a closed system. So... Um, you're probably going to get full contact very, very quickly. So two hours is probably fine. So it's just a risk to kind of go longer than that. But if it's a closed system, uh, the only risk you have is grassiness. And if it's well filtered out, there's really not a huge risk. So you can try up to a day. Um, but uh, if you're actually doing a flow over the hops, then you're probably going to get full extraction very, very quickly. Were you talking about hopping rye elves? Uh, how to dry hop with a keg and a hop rocket. Oh, okay. Uh, now I'll go into this one. Uh, Riv River area was asking about uh, <clears throat> hopping raw ales. Is it done in the mash tun? Uh, you can do it in the mash tun. We don't prefer to do it in the mash tun because we give our grains to uh, animals to eat and hops can be toxic to most animals. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we don't like to do that. We like, uh, as we mentioned a little bit before, we like to actually hop our spark water. Um, with that, you can actually boil the hops, pull some IPUs out of them, and actually simulate IPAs that way. It's a little bit different. You don't have the sugars for uh, some of the, those things to hold on to. So you will, will get a different utilization out of those hops. But we like to do it with the sparg water, run it right over the uh, mash tun, and then uh, get it all in there. Yeah, if you do not use clarifiers, does it, does it impact taste or just for the looks of it? Um, so especially with raw ales, there is a big protein kind of factor that comes into play. Uh, proteins can have kind of a, um, a partly a grainy flavor, but also sometimes kind of a, a meaty flavor, an actual proteiny flavor. So we like to use clarifiers to kind of reduce that unless we're doing a mixed firm. So mixed firms will kind of take care of all that over time. Um, that bread and that patio kind of go in a cycle and chew each other up, um, chew up all the proteins. Uh, in which case, it's not a risk of flavor because you're going to end up with a, a really fantastic tasting mixed from beer um, several, several months down the road. Uh, but if you need to get that beer out pretty quick, then you have to use those clarifiers to make sure that you're not getting the extra protein flavor that can come along with it. You don't want it to be overly grainy or overly proteiny. Uh, yeah, Daniel, this is not uh, <clears throat> Acer Glen or Acer Glen, as it said. No, Acer Glen is a mix of mead. We drank it with Thomas the other day. That was stupid good. Uh, you should also send us more. Yeah. Um, 
<clears throat> people trying to come yeah, in. Yeah, like way early, dude. Did did we even look at the internet? Anyway, uh, this is 100% uh, maple. Just maple sugar, no meat in it. No honey, no nothing else. So, so it's just know. a maple, maple wine. Just it's super delicious. And no one's named it yet, so if you guys want to name it, go ahead. Acer wine. Acer wine. Ass wine? Ass wine. Ass wine. Maple, uh, maple wine is now called ass wine. Uh, can you use one of those pool filters as an inline hop rocket or Randall and transfer from one cake to another? Uh, I'd assume so. If yes, whole leaf would be better. As Jamie, long as it's brand new. You are right about that. 100% that whole leaf is better than uh, pellet hops. Um, the reason being that you probably all experienced pellet hops afterwards are kind of a almost cementy like product and they will clog things up really fast. The whole leaf hops will still kind of clog that up. So you have to do it uh, gently and the right way but yes you can 100% do that um, if it you know just make sure that everything's clean very clean and sanitary to do that acids for lowering the pH does also help extend the shelf life and is to so what is too low of a pH it kind of depends on uh, what you're talking about uh, short answer is no acids aren't going to help necessarily extend the shelf life they're really good they're there to protect against bacteria pre-fermentation so fermentation is going to lower the pH to below and easy for bacteria to grow pH regardless um, you're aiming for that below 4.2 to really be safe um, but fermentation will naturally get the beer below 4.2 so acids don't do anything beyond that for uh, long term shelf stability um, too low is going to be I wouldn't go pretty much any lower than if you're doing acids pre-fermentation, I really wouldn't go below 4.2, 4 point. I, I like to kind of aim for 4.5 that way. Early fermentation really drops it below that 4.2, but I don't like to go too much lower because I really don't want to stall out the yeast. Uh, let me preface this by saying that when, when he's <clears> saying <throat> that acids won't uh, preserve the, or extend the shelf life, meaning that, lower pH is not going to preserve the shelf life necessarily. Adding specific acids like scorbic acid will help shelf life through the oxidative process, but the lowering of the pH is not what helps that. Yeah. Does raw ale work in a pro brewer brewery or mainly a home brewery? We've done it on pro brewer scales quite a bit. Uh, I would honestly say that uh, there is a good third to half of our beers that are raw. Um, one, because we like the flavor, two, because it's easier, and three, because we like the fa flavor and it's easier. Yeah. It saves us a lot of time. We don't have a lot of time, so we yeah. like to do a lot of raw ales. It's not the, easy, it's not the easiest thing to do, and if you're not good at it as a uh, pro brewer, don't do it because you're going to you know, upset a lot of people. But if you can really get that flavor profile down, know how it's going to react, know what you're coming out with in the very end, it's actually a great thing to do as a pro brewer because y you cut your brew day in half, basically. Yeah, a brew day for us can take eight, nine, ten hours pretty easily. And so being able to cut out you know, four or five hours just by not doing the mash and boil or not doing the end of the mash steps and the early boil steps or the full boil, um, it makes a huge difference. Yeah, it really, really does. You know, so it, it, that's the thing. I mean, but if you're <clears throat> not making good beers doing it, don't do it. That, that's the basics about everything we say. Make good beer first. Yep. Frazzled Penguin, I heard that a longer boil will help with shelf life. Is that true? And what occurs to improve shelf life? Uh, yeah, we've talked about quite a bit on this channel about how a longer boil time helps improve shelf life. And that actually has to do with a byproduct of the Maillard reaction. Um, so with the right precursors in, um, in the mash of the, or the wort during your longer boil time, um, you're going to be throwing off what's called reductones. Reductones are a really good antioxidant. Um, they work in the same way. That's the same reason we use, uh, one of the reasons we use ascorbic acid in the mash is it actually um, boosts the impact of the Maillard reaction uh, during the boil time um, by throwing off those reductones. So the reductones are, are, are what you're after to help improve the shelf life, and that's what you get off of the longer boil time and what you get off of ascorbic acid in the mash. Um, so those two things kind of actually work together is, is why, is why you get more shelf stable beers with longer boil times. Would raw mm. beers also be reasonably doable in a homebrew setup? Super easily doable. Mm -hmm. uh, 
probably easier to do in a homebrew setup than a professional setup because if you don't have a kettle do some raw beers and away you go most professional setups kettles come with the uh, mash tun so you already have it uh, have you yeah. heard of rima quike rima quike i uh, have not heard of rima quike caramely or nutty profile um yeah jimmy use that in a brown and then get a superior pitch i would take some Definitely. I'll play around with it. Um, well, yeah, Drunkula was uh, commenting on Joel's setup there. Yeah, uh, no, we, uh, we have not heard of uh, Rima Quake. We actually, you know, as much as we love Quake, um, that's probably one of the yeast families we have done the least wide experimentation uh, with mainly because it's a little bit harder to get a hold of uh, some of the cultures. All right. Is that pretty much close to the end of our questionings? I, I think we got most of the main question. Oh, there was a question, Pamela. I skipped over it. I'm sorry. It wasn't about raw beers or anything like that. So we'll get back to it right now. She asked a question about the uh, cherry dubel, uh, what yeast we would uh, recommend for that and to go over the hops again. Uh, yeast recommend, recommending for that. Honestly, most of the Trappist strains will be great. For cherry, I think, honestly, I might go with Arden. Hmm. Um, Arden is in the white yeast in Imperial that is Gnome. Gnome. Yeah. It's the uh, Hoblone Sheaf uh, yeast. Which, by the way, the Hoblone Sheaf, sh- 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 whatever, sheaf, that, that, oh, that uh, Belgian IPA that they make is oh, so good. Man, so good. Uh, Arden, my experience, Arden t- tends to be much more fruity as well as a little bit more bubblegummy rather than the high spicy phenolic. And I think that would go really well with the uh, dark candy flavors of the Dubel as well as the cherry flavors coming in there. Um, as far as going over hops again, uh, again, if you want to make a hop presence, I would pick something very red berry, fruity, or floral. Uh, Barbaroo sticks out to me to make a hop presence. Other than that, old school Belma. Oh yeah, Belma would be really nice yeah. in there. Uh, Bramling Cross, actually. Oh yeah, a little spicy, a little black currant. Um, other than that, personally, I would make the hops take a background in it. If I was hopping it, it'll probably be something like a Stressel Spalt or even Magnum. Keep it very low, very traditionally spicy, because you want the yeast the uh, Belgian sugars and the uh, cherry really to shine through. Yeah. All right. All right. I think so, that's pretty much it for questions. And we actually might get out of here by the time we've got to open. Oh, wow. Uh, one of the bets that uh, people are uh, sitting in their car right now waiting. I'm, I was 30% sure they're like marketer people. They're like here to sell us stuff. Maybe. I, I feel like I have seen the guy before though. Oh, okay. Like, I don't know, though. But I only got for, a quick for look. That's the vibe that I got when they were like, walking around. Like, they went over to the pizza place, and I was like, ah, they might be just here to sell They might be here to sell us stuff, which if they're here to give us free beer, I'm for it. Okay, so, uh, Joel, thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate the uh, super chat, most definitely. Glad we can uh, answer your questions for you. Uh, what do you think of dropping frozen blueberries in a pale ale at Flame Out? in a uh, muslin bag uh they should be frozen i mean frozen fruit helps you get better extraction the freezing is going to help drop the temperature on it uh it'll probably keep it high enough to make it sanitary on that so that's probably okay generally uh, uh, actually i mean it's probably an okay uh, way to do it do it see how it uh, turns out send us a bottle thanks everybody for tuning in We are Genus Brewing. Subscribe to our channel. Smash that like button. Like, Hulk smash it because we need a few of them. Uh, Like our other channel, Genus Not Brewing. Follow us on all the Instagrams. And uh, tune in next week when we drink more beer and answer beer questions. Because we love you. Okay.